Maybe I can be of help. The boy's right. Maybe it's time he found another people. No. I'm the one who brought him to you, and now I'll return him to where he belongs. I won't let you. He's my cub. We knew this day would come. We are the only family he's ever known. Raksha. It's the only place he'll be safe. It's okay, Ami. It won't go far. I'll come back and visit. Uh, the key leaving the pack uh, scene from the Jungle Book. John Favreau is the director. John, hello. Uh, welcome to the program. Just uh, just explain that scene. Could you just to, uh, to to get us launched on this? Well, if you if you um, if you know the Kipling and uh, or, or remember the animated film, there's a, a character named Shere Khan, this ferocious tiger who who looms over the jungle as the apex predator, who has decided as Mowgli's on the cusp of manhood that it is time for the man cub to either be destroyed or leave, and. Uh, and he threatens the all of the animal kingdom that if the if the boy isn't gone by the time the water truce is over, um, that, that he's going to come get him. And so the boy decides that it's time for him to go back, and they're going to bring him back to the man village where he could be with his own kind. And when you hear that just as audio, because we weren't playing in any right. pictures, what with this being radio and everything, yes. Do you think I've heard? This, I really don't want to hear this again. I've gone through this so many times. So do you think okay, this is this is great? Well, because so much of it was, you know, I, I, we really had it work as a radio play before we ever animated. We recorded everything with the actors uh, together whenever we could and with, with uh, Neil Seti, who plays Mowgli, performing with them. We had to make it work as a radio play. And then from there, you turn that over to the animators and we begin to figure out how we're going to motion capture it, keyframe animate it, and, and ultimately film the boy to fit in with all of these uh, digital elements so I like it. I, I, I chose the cast because of their voices, and you heard there Sir Ben Kingsley, who, who has a nice set of pipes on him. He does. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> he does, doesn't he? Can I um, ask you about Neil Seti then? Because obviously there's a technology conversation to be had, but you, obviously you had to get the right yeah, locally. And when, important. when Lenny Abrahamson was in to talk about Room, and he was talking about casting the boy, mm -hmm. and obviously crucial, and what an extraordinary film that was, yeah, and yeah. what a great discovery he was. And we, and we hear directors saying, it was very important to get the casting right, and we knew we had to find the right boy. But I don't think I've ever seen a movie where the boy is the only character. <laughs> he really so is. So Neil Setti is the only live actor that we see. There was enormous pressure. It's on enormously this important, right. especially because we made the decision early on that we were not going to have the animals emote beyond what an animal normally could we would we would manipulate that that their movement and and their facial you know their facial expressions to a certain point but the fact was you needed to cut to the kid to see to check in and, and to bring the humanity to it you can only do so much with a voice uh and so it was we we, we required somebody that was going to carry the emotional weight of the film and we also you know, we're concerned about any time you have a, a a young actor, you want to make sure they don't outstay their welcome. It's it's, it's rare that you, there's a child actor that you want to watch for an hour and a half. They they, you know, it's nice to walk in and out as the neighbor's kid in a sitcom, but but to actually have them carry a film, much like in the case of Room, um, you you require uh, you know somebody who's got a very special set of qualities. So where did you find Neil Setti? You know, we did a, he was in Manhattan. We had searched the globe. <laughs> We'd gone through all the, the usual suspect, the actors that had had some experience, and we finally found somebody who had not only never acted before, but never auditioned before. He was nine, which was younger than we thought we'd go. And, this is uh, almost too Hollywood. John. It this really is. was. <laughs> and he had, you know, he just was very charismatic. He had no fear. He was athletic. He was, uh, you know, he played sports. He... He did some martial arts on the audition tape and said he was he he was going to do all his own stunts as well, and he just had a great attitude that reminded me uh, a lot of the kid from the animated film from 1967. He looks he looks like him. He kind of does, and he's got like a glow. He's just I've been doing interviews with the kid now all around the world. I never get tired of watching this kid talk. I don't know what it is. There's just something about certain people that make you smile when you watch them just behaving and he's one of those people why did you decide you mentioned about deciding not to Im make the animals emote too much yeah. why why did you decide that it starts to I, i'm very uh reticent about the use of cgi which is 
sounds funny because I made a, a movie that's completely computer rendered here other than the kid. But part of why I think I've had success in the past on, on, on films like Iron Man and, and the effects have looked good is because I've never asked too much of the effects. And when you ask things to behave in a way that they don't in nature, it starts to make things look fake, even if they're well executed. And so creating parameters to create a sense of naturalism to this version of the Jungle Book was important to me. Iron Man was 2008, mm -hmm. I think. Yeah. This movie wouldn't have been possible then, would it? No, no. I was just becoming comfortable with rendering hard surfaces like um, metal, like a suit. Uh, it's always easier to do things that are, that are metallic rather than fur and flesh. Uh, but they had asked me uh, originally to, to do uh, the Hulk uh, as one of the choices because if you remember, Marvel had two titles in their first wave. One was Iron Man, one was the Incredible Hulk. And I didn't feel the technology was there for the Hulk yet. And I was concerned about being able to do it convincingly. Uh, of course, it, you could CGI doesn't have to be perfect to tell a good story, but from my sensibility, I like it to be. I, I want to pull it off like a magic trick where it's indistinguishable. Can you explain... Uh, for those of us who've never played with these toys, what yeah. it is, what it is that has developed the kit that you were given yeah. last year and the uh, w to assemble this extraordinary finished product. Well, it was a combination of technologies, but but the uh, the key partner here was a, a was a, a company right here in London called MPC, and they had you know uh, state of the art tools. They developed some new tools to render things like fur and make the water behave in a believable way and have the little things like the skin move over the muscle in a believable way. Little things that, that tell your mind subconsciously that you're looking at something real. And so when you, when you peel it down to its most simple layer, it's you're, you're generating an environment, uh, much like a video game would, except it's finished to a much higher level of reality. And you're animating characters that are basically rigged digital puppets that the, the, the animators either use the reference of motion capture, which we did on this movie, to help drive the animation, or the performances uh, of the facial expressions of the actors, which also was incorporated into this. And it's a combination of the editor, uh, the people who are editing the footage, the people who are animating, the people who are art directing the background. And ultimately, these digital tools are serving the same purpose that in Walt Disney's days you know, background painters would use or um, animators, ink and paint people who would who would use brushes and paint to do the same thing that we're using computers to do in a much more sophisticated way. But I can't impress enough, these are handmade films where these are all artists who are using these digital tools to help mm. um, fool the audience into believing they're seeing something real. And you mentioned Walt Disney. Many people, including myself, would consider Jungle Book to be his greatest oh, wow. movie. Okay. There must have been a point where it's not a scary question, by the way. Uh, you must have thought, uh, "Hmm, do I want to go here?" Or was it an obvious choice for you? I, I wasn't scared of it. I don't think that. I certainly the studio didn't understand how um, significant of a legacy that film had, and I'm not sure why. Maybe it was because it was a uh, '67, and a lot of us grew up with it. Um, because there's not that same level of preciousness taken with films like. Um, you know, when they make Snow White and the Huntsman or, or Alice in Wonderland, they, they take a lot of liberties with the material. Uh, and even even uh, Cinderella, to some, to some extent, they took some liberties, and definitely Maleficent. But with this one, people were very concerned about the music. They were very concerned about moments in it. And then there's also the Kipling, which was uh, a, a, the source material that we, we leaned on as well, which is much different in tone and much different... Uh, they're different characters. It, Walt Disney took a lot of liberty with the source material there. And if you just look at the, the, the children's version of the musical version of this film that we grew up with and you did that in live action, it wouldn't work. And so we had to make it a bit more of, a, of an adventure film and feel a little bit more in line with the older Disney animated classics and films like The Lion King where there was a real sense of danger. And so mixing that dangerous tone with the music and the humor we, uh, we try to stay consistent with the, with the Disney tradition, but also include the things that we've grown to love, like mm. the music and the humor and the personality of the characters from the original film. Did you always know which songs you were going to include? Was there ever a moment where you thought, actually, we don't need the songs? It started off, there was no, there was no music when I was hired, and I felt that we had to work in 
for, first I got bare necessities in, and then the idea <laughs> of I want to be like you, is there a way to, with the menacing environment and scene and character that Christopher Walken plays with yes. King Louis, was there going to be a way to work that music in too? And then, of course, we also wove in a lot of the music into the score. So if you're familiar with the film, you'll hear a lot of a lot of uh, tips of the hat to to the old the old themes. And in the end credits, we have a, a number of wonderful songs. But but the challenge was how much music could you have without turning into a musical, which would inevitably reduce the stakes and the sense of of danger that I think is required to make a film of this size and scale that appeals to this broad of an audience. And you say it started as a radio play, essentially, and you chose your vocal cast very carefully, and uh, people will love Bill Murray, of course. Oh, yeah, he's fantastic. Uh, And you mentioned Ben Kingsley and Idris Elba. Yes. Uh, How terrifying is he? And Scarlett Johansson, I mean, this this is first-rate material. First-rate. And, uh, and and Idris, if you you know if you've ever had him in here, you know he could not be further from that in life. He's the most uh, uh, engaging, enthusiastic uh, person, and he's a you know he's an actor who is really coming into his own now. And both he and Lupita Nyong'o are are you know being recognized for their talent and have really really rich backgrounds in in uh, in, in theater and film. And so it's a, it was a really fun time to work with them too, the new wave of these stars that are just starting to pop now. So it was a, and then of course Neil, who, who's never done anything before. And so we had a really good mix of experience, cast, and, and people who were new. Everybody felt enthusiasm. And what's so fun now is to show them the finished product, which although I showed them uh, artwork and I discussed what it would be, it's not till you s- sit in a the theater and see this, especially in 3D, and the thing just hits you like a, like a wave. It's it's a, quite an overwhelming experience for me when I saw this for the first time. Mm-hmm. I, I've just seen it the once. I'm determined to see it again. I think it's probably my favorite film of the year. I think That's it's high praise. Thank you. Absolutely sensational. Can I ask you, on behalf of uh, families who I know will once once it, it's out there and they're wondering who they can take to see this? Yeah, this is a PG certificate. It is scary. I mean, the the fact is the violence is off screen. Uh, I have I have three kids. But I really embraced what, you know, in the Disney tradition, letting the world be scary from time to time. And, and uh, you know, and, and the, there's, there's a, an intensity that comes with the 3D and with the um, just the realism of the image. Uh, and it's a scary bad guy who's trying to catch the kid. Uh, but I, I would say that there, again, if you know your kid, uh, I've heard very young kids who've seen it, enjoyed it. Take a look at the trailer online. Don't assume it's going to be like the cartoon from the '60s. It's it's a bit it's a bit. Um, well, I think that's the key that. thing, isn't it? It is more intense, yeah. and it yeah. is. But look at the violent. trailer. What you know, the, the marketing department from Disney actually did a really good job of showing the tone. And if anything, the trailer plays is darker than the film. So if they if if your kids like the trailer and you think they could handle it, you know, I, I would be comfortable bringing them the film. But if you're on the fence. You know, go see it yourself. It's going to be a good film. And then if you think it's something your kids could handle, bring them back again. There's enough to see in this movie. It's worth checking out twice. And did you, uh, at the end of it, think, I'd like to go back and do this again? I would love to work with these tools again. Oh, yeah. Now I, you know, it's taken me three years. I finally, now you go from a novice to, to somebody who's an expert because people don't play, not a lot of people are using these tools. And now that I've, uh, gotten a, a comfortable understanding of, of how to tell stories with them, you know, your, your imagination just opens up. And, and especially if you go back to the Kipling, there's so many stories. And, and uh, what a great group, uh, company of actors I have. You don't want to let them go. Yeah. And, I, and I don't mind working on a film for this long if, if, the, if the effect is, is this dramatic. So Jungle Book 2. I'd love to. I'd love to. We have to see how it goes. With the big movies, it's they It's going to uh, go fine, John. I hope honestly. so. Honestly. Cheers. The Thank reviews you. are extraordinary. I mean, you must be hugely relieved. I am relieved. Because you don't know. You don't know. You're, you're taking a lot of... You're, you're making a lot of choices with your casting decisions, with the tone of the film. You know, how, um, how much do you want to make it feel like a, a, an action-adventure movie? And what, what happens is now, I think Disney was very happy that the people who are the most curious were actually the older uh, uh, set. And not not old people like me, but old people like the you know the millennials who might not want to go see a movie you know with one ten year old kid and talking animals. That's not usually an older skewing film. No. And now because of because of the way it was executed, there seems to be an excitement about it, and uh, and I think that's an unexpected surprise that we're all embracing. John Favreau, thanks very much for your time.